Good afternoon. It's Thursday, February 26. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. Attorney General Yehuda Weinstein is expected to decide by Sunday whether to launch a criminal investigation into the various affairs regarding the spending at Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's official residence. IBA's Ellie Wagelanter has that story. Attorney General Yehuda Weinstein convened a meeting today with senior officials from the state prosecutor's office to consider allegations of financial improprieties by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sarah. State prosecutors were expected to recommend that Weinstein widen the probe into the allegations and summon employees at the official residence for interrogation. Police have said that the Netanyahu's may also be called in for questioning. The Attorney General's office is examining details beyond what was written in the State Controls Report, published on Tuesday, on excessive spending by the Prime Minister and his wife. The Netanyahu's could face criminal charges over the accusation that Sarah Netanyahu pocketed some 4,000 shekels of bottle refunds for recycling. Additional accusations that she purchased a set of patio furniture identical to the patio furniture at the official residence, which was subsequently delivered to the Netanyahu's private residence in Caesarea, could also get them into trouble. A decision by Weinstein to order a police investigation into the allegations could be politically significant two weeks before Israel holds general elections on March 17th. The Netanyahu's ex-caretaker, Meni Naftali, is expected to complete his testimony today at the Laha 443 Fraud Investigation Unit. Earlier this week, the ex-custodian said he was receiving death threats and demanded a security detail. He also filed a defamation lawsuit against Likud and several close associates of Netanyahu for smearing his name. A third alleged scandal over a scheme to overpay an electrician by inviting him to do work on weekends and holidays and a subsequent cover-up may also result in criminal charges. Ellie Wagelanter, IBA News. The political fallout continues following the state comptroller's scathing housing report, dealing with skyrocketing prices and the failure of three governments to improve the situation. We get more on that story from IBA's Margo Dudkevich. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took less than a minute to address the state comptroller's report that examined the housing crisis from 2008 to 2013. We are taking the report seriously. We did a lot, and the report acknowledges that. But we still have a lot to do, and I will do it in my next government, Netanyahu vowed, during a visit in Malaya Dumim. He then addressed the growing Iranian nuclear threat. As expected, the report drew harsh criticism from across the political spectrum. Zionist Union, Itzhak Herzog, thanked the controller for releasing a courageous report, saying it proves Netanyahu did nothing to solve the housing crisis. Herzog vowed to lead the battle to solve the housing crisis in the next government. Yesha Tidhead, Yair Lapid, said the report proves Netanyahu is at fault. He didn't even try to increase the supply or bring down the prices, he said. The public did not need a report to understand the housing problem because they encounter it daily, Moshe Kahlon, head of the Kulanu party, said. So what does the report reveal? While no blame was placed on any single individual, it states that during the five-year period, housing prices skyrocketed to around 55 percent, and rentals rose some 30 percent, while salaries remained almost the same. The crisis, Yosef Shapiro wrote, most significantly impacts society's weaker sectors and the middle class representing 73 percent of the renter's market in Israel. Between 2008 and 2013, the number of monthly salaries it would take to purchase a home escalated from 103 to 137, with the average proportion of a monthly salary needed for rent rising from 29% to 38%. Poor government planning and disregard for the middle class played key roles in creating the severe housing crisis which, if unaddressed, will eventually have a devastating impact on the entire economy, the controller warned. The report found that many of the established committees set up to cut through the normal red tape were ineffective and were not properly supervised. 
He also faltered the Bank of Israel's policies of keeping interest rates low in order to keep consumer prices stable and support economic growth, saying they failed to assist and in some instances aggravated the problem. Real estate tax relief was ineffectual, the report noted. All of the major political parties are now busy spinning the findings of the report to point blame at others. And until election day, they will explain to voters how they can fix the problem if elected. Once the new government is formed, well, that's a different story. Margot Dutkevich, IBA News. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has launched a direct broadside at Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. While answering questions from Congressman Gerald Connolly, Kerry said that Netanyahu's judgment has been flawed in the past and is once again skewed regarding the emerging Iranian nuclear deal. And meanwhile, we have the head of another government coming to speak to Congress under circumstances that, in my view, are shameful. But nonetheless, it's, he's coming. And he's not keeping his powder dry. And he is somebody, as the ranking member indicated, with an existential concern about this. And he says, that's going to be a bad ag agreement. It's so bad, that's why I'm coming to speak to Congress. I've got to go over the heads of the Secretary of State and the President of the United States and plead with Congress and the American public to derail this agreement because it's going to threaten Israel and, frankly, other nations in the region. Um, so he's not keeping his powder dry, Mr. Secretary. He's not keeping his powder dry, and it's awfully hard for no, us to uh, pretend and, and, he is. And that's something that you and people in Israel and everybody else have to make your judgment about. I, I'm not going to get dragged into that particular uh, choice or how it came about. Uh, I don't think that's helpful. I will say this. It's his criticism I'm asking you to address. Well, I, l let me say this. The prime minister, as you recall, was profoundly forward-leaning and uh, uh, outspoken about the importance of uh, invading Iraq uh, under George W. Bush, and we all know what happened with that decision. He was extremely outspoken about how bad the interim agreement was, during which time he called it the deal of the century for Iran, even though it has clearly stopped Iran's program, and more importantly, he has decided it would be good to continue it. So, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, I talk to him frequently. Uh, we work very, very closely together. Uh, we are deeply committed, we, this administration. I think we've done more to help Israel. I have a packet of 25 pages or more of things we've done on behalf of Israel in the course of this administration to stand up for it, stand with it protect, uh, fight back against unfair initiatives. So we won't take a backseat to anybody in our commitment to the state of Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu rebuffed the criticism coming from Washington. Speaking in Malay Adumim, Netanyahu accused world powers of forsaking their pledge to prevent Tehran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Based on the agreement coming together, said Netanyahu, it appears that the world powers have given up their commitment, and in a few years, Iran will develop the means to create fissile material for the production of many nuclear weapons. He went on to say, maybe the great powers will accept a nuclear Iran, but I will continue to do all in my power to prevent such a great danger to Israel. The High Court today rejected an appeal to cancel the ruling of the Central Elections Committee to impose a five-minute delay on the broadcast of Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to Congress next Tuesday. Joining us to discuss the implications of the speech, an expert on U.S.-Israel relations and a former liaison to Congress, Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, is the Prime Minister's insistence on making the speech to Congress helping or harming chances that the House and Senate will take steps to block the apparent Iranian nuclear deal? Well, Congress considers the Prime Minister to be an expert witness on the issue of Iran, which is threatening most critical American, Israeli, and worldwide uh, interest. In fact, uh, behind the prime minister's uh, trip to Washington, there is a very unique coalition of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, 
All of them want Netanyahu to be in Washington. All of them have dismissed completely uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry and uh, President Obama. They do not consider the U.S. to be the, of the same posture of deterrence as the U.S. used to be until 2008. They are uh, mind-boggled about the track record of John Kerry and President uh, Obama, both of whom, for instance, considered Hafez Assad and Bashar Assad to be constructive leaders and pressured Israel to give away the Golan Heights, both of whom do not recognize the reality of Islamic terrorism, both of whom believe that they should embrace the Muslim Brotherhood, the largest terrorist organization in the Middle East, and they have turned a cold shoulder towards Mubarak. They betrayed the Iranian opposition back in 2009. But Returning to the internal uh, American politics, though, um, Kerry and Susan Rice have been uh, criticizing Netanyahu, and Rice said that the prime minister is harming the usual bipartisan support for Israel. Are they correct? Well, uh, Susan Rice and John Kerry and President Obama uh, do not enjoy the support of most American people when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, uh, CNN poll and CNN has been an, an, uh, a systematic supporter of President Obama. A CNN poll February 16 demonstrates that Americans consider President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech at, in Congress to be of vital interest. Americans do not agree with Obama's rebuke of, uh, of Netanyahu, and certainly, and certainly, Americans consider Israel to be one of the top five major allies of the U.S. Uh, today in the world. A Gallup poll of uh, February 2015 shows 70 percent support of Israel, while only 17 percent support the Palestinian Authority, which enjoys the backing of President uh, Obama. Uh, the Israeli lobby, APEC, is heavily invested in the Iranian nuclear issue. Uh, their conference next week has been somewhat put into disarray by the uh, divisive nature of Netanyahu's Senate appearance. Might it not have been more effective if Netanyahu and perhaps opposition leader Herzog could have stood together at APEC to call for Congress to block what Israel views as a bad idea? Well, and a bad I, I deal. Th I think I think that uh, a member of Knesset Herzog should consider it and join Netanyahu and appeal to Congress and to Obama to reject a bad uh, deal. In fact, the Arabs, the pro-American Arab countries, have just called to uh, reject the current uh, deal because they say bad deal is much worse than no uh, deal. But one should go back to 1981. Three weeks, three weeks before election in 1981, Prime Minister Begin bombed the Iraqi nuclear reactor. He was accused by the Israeli opposition of playing politics and undermining American-Israeli relations. In the short run, Mr. Begin was rebuked, condemned, and punished by the entire world. In the long run, it was that defiance of the U.S. of the U.S which earned Israel long-term esteem, enhanced U.S.-Israel relations to the highest ever uh, level, and in fact, spared the U.S. and nuclear confrontation in 1991. Ambassador Yoram Ettinger, thanks so much for being our guest, Thank as you. always. Iran's elite Revolutionary Guard staged war games in the Strait of Hormuz yesterday, including a gunboat attack on a huge mock-up model U.S. warship. The event was Tehran's latest display of military muscle in a Gulf shipping channel vital to the world oil exports. Some 30 percent of all seaborne oil trade flows through the Strait of Hormuz, and U.S. officials have expressed concerns in the past that Iran could try to disrupt the oil flow or even attack American warships patrolling waters of the Gulf. A ceremony marking the exercises was attended by commanders of the Guard as well as by parliamentary speaker Ali Larijani. Iranian state TV showed a number of gunboats swarming the huge model warship and blasting it with missiles. The gunboats also carried out an exercise in laying mines. The masked Islamic State executioner known as Jihadi John 
heard talking in a British accent before beheading hostages held by the group, has been identified as Mohammed Mwazi. A Washington Post report today said Mwazi, 26 years old, was born in Kuwait and grew up in a well-to-do family in West London. He graduated with a computer programming degree from the University of Westminster. He is believed to have traveled to Syria around 2012 to join ISIS. According to media reports, British authorities have known of his identity for some months, but did not want to reveal it publicly for operational reasons. In more local news, a Greek Orthodox institution on Jerusalem's Mount Zion was set ablaze early this morning in what police believe is likely an anti-Christian hate crime. No one was injured in the incident, but a room was damaged in the fire. Graffiti disparaging Jesus was spray painted on the walls of the institution. Firefighters extinguished the blaze and said that the fire was apparently started near the window of the bathroom and showers, increasing the suspicion of arson. But it was very important and to discuss the issue and the authorities are very much uh, concerned and they promised us that they would take care uh, of all the necessary steps in order to uh, protect uh, not only this uh, property here, but also the whole area of the Mount Zion, which is uh, so important and extremely uh, holy for uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims as uh, well. Maybe some of the Jews, they do it because a lot of times, a lot of times, they write out outside the gate of the cemetery and they write the bad things about Virgin Mary. Former Ramat Gan Mayor Tzvi Bar was convicted today in the Tel Aviv District Court on charges of receiving bribes totaling some two million shekels. He was also convicted on charges of money laundering, breach of trust, obstruction of justice and tax evasion. Bar received nearly a quarter of a million dollars from real estate mogul Shao Lagziel for promoting the Beit Lir Or project and Tamarine Towers project. In return for his help, Barr's son was given shares in the company and was appointed to a management position. Three real estate developers, Chaim Gare, Shlomi Lagziel and David Levy, were convicted of paying bribes and money laundering. The revamp of Argentina's intelligence service is facing its final hurdle, with the National Congress poised to create a new agency after the government said a renegade spy was linked to the death of prosecutor Alberto Nisman. Nisman was found with a bullet in his head a day before he was to present, present evidence accusing Argentinian President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner of trying to cover up Iran's alleged role in the 1994 bombing of the Amia Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. Apple CEO Tim Cook made a surprise visit to Israel and inaugurated the company's new offices in Herzliya Pituach. Cook met with President Ruven Rivlin and told him that 800 employees will be working at the Research and Development Center, which is Apple's second largest in the world. Apple recently purchased Israeli startups Anabit and PrimeSense, and analysts speculate that new deals are in the works. Rivlin tried to impress Cook with his, or at least his grandkids, intimate knowledge of Apple products. Everyone in Israel appreciates uh, your company. Everyone of Israel can praise himself and say whenever he would like to really show that he's something, that he has the uh, iPad, <laughs> iPhone, iPad. My, my, my grandchildren without iPad, they say, if, you are, if, you are, if we, your grandchildren, without iPad, it means that you are not a grandfather. <laughs> I cannot use, I know only how to write down with a pencil or, <laughs> or a pen, but um, nevertheless, when my assistants are helping me, especially my grandchildren, and I have nine grandchildren, and everyone is a great expert of uh, knowing how to find its way, and they are doing, you are doing miracles for the whole world. An enormous admiration for Israel. Uh, not, not only as a huge ally to the U.S., but as a place to do business. And, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, Johnny's a very key member of our executive team. Uh, we've, we hired our first uh, individual in Israel in 2011, and we now have over 700 people working in Israel directly for us, uh, and over 6,000 people developing applications for the iOS platform. And so 
Uh, Israel and Apple have gotten much closer together in the last three years than ever before. And we see that as just the beginning of the things that we can do together. A memorial service for 552 IDF soldiers whose burial site is unknown was held today at the Mount Herzl Military Cemetery. The first such shoulder was Yosef Glossman, who went missing in 1914. President Reuven Rivlin, Defense Minister Moshe Bugialon, and families of the deceased took part in the ceremony. Rivlin related to the fact that the memorial is held on the 7th of the Hebrew month of Adar, which tradition says was the day that Moshe died, whose burial place is also unknown. He said the memories are not dependent on graves, but are carried in our hearts, thoughts, and prayers. Both the president and the defense minister said the country is doing its utmost to find the soldiers' remains and bring them back to Israel for burial. The Purim holiday is just around the corner, and with it comes the usual expense for families. The cost of costumes can be prohibitively high for many, starting at 100 shekels and going up from there. Several groups of parents around the country are now adopting sharing initiatives to pass on their children's old outfits, sometimes in exchange for new ones or given free in a gesture of goodwill. The Good Neighbor, Neighbor Katamon NGO here in Jerusalem, for example, held a fair earlier this month, selling hundreds of used and revamped costumes at nominal fees to help everyone enjoy the Purim festivities without incurring financial distress. And on top of all that holiday spirit, Organizers donated all of the proceeds from the Katamon Fair to charity. In local money matters, the shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading, while shares were up on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange on the last day of the trading week. Here are the late afternoon numbers. Looking at the weather forecast and temperatures are expected to rise tomorrow, making it warmer than normal for this time of the year. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a great weekend, and shalom from Jerusalem.